Good evening, Beruchim Abayim Avotai. Tonight's class and brachot and everything is Lilui Nishmat David Ben Tamo Ben Harush. Tehi nafshot tzura b'tzura chayim meganedin ayon. Amen and amen. Azal tov on the siyum, amazing. Um, it's a big zichut. Everybody who gets to attend the siyum, very big zichut. The chida discusses it at length, what it does to just hearing the person making the siyum. The chida writes, it's a zgula to have a good memory. In today's generation, we should say it's a zgula to have good memories because some people don't want to remember their life. You should have a good life. They should want to remember it and have a good memory to remember it. And the stipler said, it's brought down, I think, in Kaina de Igrita, that to make a siyum on Seder Nashim for a single boy is a zgula for a good shiduch. So you started early, Baruch Hashem. No. You might have put the, your market value up a little bit tonight now. And now on to business. So we'll talk about the parasha a little bit this week. And maybe we'll learn something nice. The Torah says, when God tells Moshe and Aaron to go to Paro. So the words are, Vayera perek vav in Shemot uh, Yud Gimel. The Pasuk says, Vayedabe Hashem el Moshe ve'el Aaron. Hashem spoke to Moshe and Aaron. Vayitzavem el Bnei Yisrael. And he commanded them on what they're going to say to the Jewish nation, Ve'el Paro, and to Paro, the Avdil, Melech Mitzrayim, the king of Egypt, they'll see it, Bnei Yisrael, Melech Mitzrayim. They should go, they had to do two things, to notify the Jews that they're taking them out, and to also notify Paro that, you know, the joke's over, the Jews are going to leave. So, Chazal bothered by, why does the Torah say that Hashem went to Moshe and Aaron, Ve'itzavem, and then, he already says, Vaydaber Hashem is speaking to them. Everything Hashem says is a commandment, automatically. So why did the, why did the Pasuk have to stick in a second word? It should have just said, Vaydaber Hashem and Moshe and Aaron. God told Moshe and Aaron to speak, Vaydaber the Bnei Yisrael, and to Paro. Or just the opposite, Vaytzavim. He commanded them to go speak to Paro. Why both? Why the extra word, Vaytzavim? So Chazal say, Kajboch warned them that you're going to speak to Paro. Paro is a king. Hey, you know, Agimlo, these are the words of Chazal, make sure you behave, you treat him. Kavod, with honor. V'chalku kavod la malchut, and share your honor with the kingdom. One is obligated to respect authority, the kingdom. Afalpi, and this is where Hashem's disclaimer comes in, this is amazing. God says, Afalpi, even though, tarich la sotpo et adin. Shanit tzarech la'asot po tadin. Hashem says, "What are you going to tell Paro that you're taking the Jews out, and if not, he's going to get hit time and time again? When you're going to threaten him, how do you threaten somebody respectfully? That's really what Hashem told him to do, right? Go threaten the king, but show him respect. It's an interesting concept, but the Torah says it's possible to do. So Hashem told him, even though I'm going to judge him now and get back at him for being a dictator for 210 years, but that's not your business." To you, he's a king, and king, Malchut, you have to respect. And it was worth adding an extra word in the Torah to teach us forever that Moshe and Aaron had a special mitzvah to give Paro Kavod. Let's put things in proportion. Paro was uh, what today we would call a modern day Hitler. Right? Chazal have many graphic descriptions in the Gemara, in the Midrashim, even more graphic, on the amount of death and havoc he brought onto the world beyond just enslaving people. Chazal, it says that at one point when he got some rash, he decided the Jewish baby's blood is going to do him well. And he slaughtered tens of thousands of kids just to use their blood for what he thought would cure him. We're talking about a mass murderer in ways that the human mind doesn't really grasp. And this is the man that God adds a word in the Torah to say, make sure you respect him. He's a king. If somebody came to you and said, you're going to meet Hitler, but make sure you have respect. He's a ruler. You say, what? Kill him, that's what I do. Uh, he's a murderer. So what's shot in this? What's going on here? So it has to be that it wasn't for the Kavod of Paro, that wasn't uh, the interest. The interest was to teach us years later at Kavachome that if God went and commanded Moshe and Aaron, which were the two greatest Jewish giants, to treat respectfully the world's greatest degenerate Paro, despite telling him that he's going to end up in trouble as he did, Kavachomer. Years later, Am Yisrael, that each one of us is a 
son of a king, when Melachim on our own right, every individual, how much one has to respect another. That's why the Torah said this. We don't care about Paro. We used Paro as a way to make a point, and to make the point very strongly. Because if we would just command Jews to respect each other, like other things like that, that slides easily. So we'll take a very extreme example. We'll use a dictator who's a degenerate, who technically we should do anything but respect him. And we'll say, respect even him. And now when you respect even him, no matter how much somebody else that bothers you in life, he's still not paro. So you still stay respectful to everybody. This is not lip service. This is very serious. And that's why I want to talk about it, because I don't think that any of us realize how serious this is. Myself included. There is a Gemara, Masechet Brachot. If I had to put a wager, I would say everybody in this room knows this Gemara, because it was the 27th page of Daf Yomi, Daf Chavchet, and we, that much we lasted in Daf Yomi, before some people fell out. So this is a very famous Gemara, but I don't think we really understand what it says in this Gemara. Now this is a story. Tanu Rabbanan, the Chachamim learned. Shechala Rabbi Elezer, when Rabbi Elezer got sick. Nichnisu Talmidav Levakro. His students went in to visit him. They realized that his situation wasn't good. And as students, if they know that their rabbi may not last much longer, they want to get from him whatever they can. So they told him, Amrulo, they told him, Rabbeinu, Rabbi, Lamdeinu Olchot Chaim, teach us the ways of life. Why do we want to know the ways of life? Vinizkebahem lechayei haolam haba. That we should merit to get the olam haba. This is an interesting mara. If you do the right thing, you'll get the olam haba, and if not, you won't. So, uh, what did they tell him? So, the Chorah, the Pshat and the Gemara is, they told him, Rabbi, being that we know that you're going to Ganeidin soon, we want to make sure that when we go up there, we're going to sit with you. So tell us, what's the contingencies, what's the conditions to make it into your section in Gan Eden? Not just any Olam Abba. We're all tzaddikim, we'll all go to Olam Abba. But we want to be with you there the same way we were with you over here. So teach us how we're going to be zochet to sit near you in Olam Abba. So we're talking about the great giants from the Talmud. You would think, what does it say? Wake up at four in the morning, do tikkun chatzot, go to the mikveh, do shira shirim, perek shira, I don't know what, learn the gemara, musa, pron, tut filin, rashi, abenuta, maybe a third in the afternoon, shimusha raba, you know, it's just a whole list. Give char- learn all day, give charity, these are all the things I would expect it to say. And the gemara doesn't say any of that. His entire response was three words, meaning, when Rabbi Elezer wanted to teach society forever, how you get to be on his level in Olam Abba, is one, three words. That's the whole story. And the whole story to the good or the bad. Meaning if you accomplish it, you made it. And if not, it makes no difference what other things you do. You won't make it. Be careful with the honor and respect of your friends. That's it! If you're a person who could vouch for yourself after 120, that your entire life you were extremely cautious, being respectful towards every person, you can sit near Rabbi Elazar in Gan Eden. And if not, you could have learned the whole Torah 500 times, but nobody's interested. We don't want to know you. And listen to what the Gaon Mivilna writes on this Gemara. It's mind boggling. The, the Gaon writes on the Gemara, Shezehu Ikal Gmilut Chasadim. This is the main part of the mitzvah of chesed. And then the Gaon elaborates. And the Gaon wrote very few words, whatever he wrote. So if he elaborated, that means this was tough to understand. And the Gaon pretty much says, I'm going to elaborate a little more to simplify it, that there are many mitz- parts to the mitzvah of milut chasadim. Somebody's poor to give him money. Somebody's hungry to feed him. Somebody, many, many parts to milut chasadim. Driving on the street, you see a friend stuck without a ride, give him a ride, even if it takes you two more minutes. The Gaon writes, what the Gemara is teaching us here is that all those qualify as chesed, and it's a great mitzvah, and you know, we always speak about the importance of chesed. Olam chesed yibane, the whole world is living on chesed. But comes the Gaon and says, over here, Abelaza wanted to teach them that the most important part of chesed is to have respect for other people. After that comes all the rest. 
I don't like talking negative about people in general, Kavachom and Bnei Yisrael, so I'm not going to say the practical implications of this. Use your own imagination. But I can just say from all my years that I was out there volunteering in different circumstances, let's just say, I've seen many that were heroes when it came to charity. They gave millions of dollars to charity, donations. They were the first to volunteer to go to hospitals, to visit sick people, to this, to that. But they had no respect for their own family. They spoke to their kids in disrespectful ways, to their spouses in disrespectful ways. And it was always a wonder to me. You're such a Baal Chesed, you go running. Why don't you understand? Chesed starts at home. Before you go to the emergency room, there's an emergency room in the dining room, first of all. Let's start there, and then we'll think about other people. And I finally understood it. The Yitzhara wants to give a person the illusion that he's a Baal Chesed. It's like this, he traps him, and he doesn't get the Rabbi Lezei in Gan Eden. That's what the Gaon's warning you. He says, you know what the is going to convince you? Go to hospitals, do Biku Cholim, Tomchei Shabbat, Tachnasat Kala, Levayat Tamed, do them all. But don't have kavod for another Jew. Because as long as you don't got kavod for another Jew, I got you. I'm keeping you out of Gan Eden. And if you do have kavod for another Jew, then you got me. You're keeping me out of your life. So I'm going to let you do all the other ones so you feel good about yourself and you don't do the important one. And that's why Rabbi Lezer told him he's a ru. He didn't tell him do chesed. Because he didn't want them to get caught up with the other things. He said, this, one, this is the chesed I want you to do. He's a ru bichvot chaverchem. How far does it go? What does it mean to have respect for somebody? <coughs> so the Mishnah talks about it. Mishnah in Pekia Avot, Perek Bet, Mishnah Yud, right? Another Mishnah that I would assume we all know by heart. The Mishnah says over there, the Tana writes, Yichvod chavercha, chaviv alecha keshelcha. The honor of your friend should be important to you as much as your own honor is. When you come to shul and you don't get something your way, it bothers you. So make sure your friends all get what they need. When somebody doesn't talk to you in a nice way, it bothers you. Make sure somebody else shouldn't feel uncomfortable the same way. Meaning, Hashem one day is going to hold every person to the standard that He set for Himself. He's going to show a person a video of how He wanted to be treated. And he's going to say, did you treat everybody else in your life the way you wanted to be treated? If you can make a V, straight to Gan Eden, go sit near Rabbi We don't have to look at anything else anymore. But if not, then, I don't know, we'll leave it at that. And this, is, again, is what the Gaon says, is the Ikar Gmilut Chasadim. If we would hear a story about somebody, what, three in the morning, woke up from bed, ran on a toilet truck to save a life, he's a hero, right? He is, and rightfully so, he is a hero, and, and should be treated as such, by the way. But if we see somebody walking into the house, even though he had a long day at work, and he's stressed out, but controls himself and he smiles, how's he, to the kids, how's your day? He goes to play Lego with his two-year-old. Do we consider him a hero? Do we make a dinner to honor him? Make a fundraiser for the heroes that are fathers? No. But he's the real hero. That's a lot greater than any other form of chesed, the Gemara says. That's the number one chesed. That's why it's so hard to do, by the way. It should be a given, no? It's the human instinct is a father wants to help his children. And you see, it's not such a given. As soon as a little stress and a little fatigue is involved, and if there's hunger on top of that, then woohoo, forget it. All brains goes out the window. And it's a big nisayon, and we have to win it, because without it, you don't get the Gan Eden. But the Gemara continues, by the way. Chazal in a few places. Sechat Shabbat, other places. They take it a step further. If you thought this was a high level, but by the Gemara, we didn't even start yet. The Gemara says, when you're going to come up to after 120, the Bedin Shemala, they're going to ask you a few questions. Now, this is my favorite test in life. A lot of times I say that in classes, people look at me like a nuts. What? Death is not a subject people want to hear about. To me, it's the dream test. If my teachers would have offered me in school that they'll give me the questions before the test, and then I got to take the test, I would have got 100 on everything. I could prepare the answers in advance. What could be better? So God tells me he's going to give me a test one day and he's giving me the questions in advance so I could have the answers ready for him. It's the, the greatest test you can get. You know exactly what you're going to have to answer. So a person's going to come and they're going to ask him a few questions. Nasata v'natata be'emunah, were you honest in business? Kavata itin matorah, did you designate, not that you learn. 
That's lamad the Torah. Kavata itim Torah. If you have a designated time, the same time every day, that you go study Torah. That's the second question. Himlachta lekoncha shachrit va'arvit. Did you acknowledge God as the king of the world in the morning and at night? We call it prayer. And then another one. The next one after that. Himlachta et chavercha benachat ruach. What does himlachta mean? Many of you are Israeli, you know Hebrew? Melech. Did you make your friend feel like a king with the utmost patience? It doesn't say, were you nice? Did you smile? Did you say Hello. Did you make every Jewish person that you interacted with in your life feel like a melech? And the Gemara warns you, the day you're born, you have access to the Gemara. And when you were in your mother's womb, you had access to it being taught directly from an angel. So from the second you were conceived, you got this message over and over again. There's going to be a day, you're going to have to face God, and you're going to have a test with four questions. And your last question to pass the test is, did you make every Jew that you interact with feel like a king? So until now we spoke about being nice, just basic dignity. Now, (laughs) I did a survey recently, not in a scientific way, in a more fun way. I started every house that I visit, I don't visit that many houses, so it's not hard for me to do, but on the rare occasion when I visit a house, instead of asking the parents how how they're doing, I go to the little ones. Ask them how they're doing. Because that's more important to me. Because then I understand what's going on in the home. The fake show that they put up when the rabbi comes, ah, I'm not interested in. You can see through that very easily. What's really going on is the question. Because that's what's important. And I'll tell you a frightening thing. I've asked tens and tens of boys and girls, young ages, three, four, five, six. When was the last time your father sat on the floor and played a game with you? And I almost never got even an answer of a date because it never happened. How is a father going to say when his own son he didn't sit on the floor and play a game with? And to the kid, that's the malchut. That's what makes him feel important. The fact that you pay his bills and pay his tuition, he doesn't want to be in school in the first place. That's not a favor for him. He'd rather stay home. You think you're a hero. I go to work, I make so much money, I pay his tuition. And then you come with the speech. The Jewish schools, they charge so much. Guess what? It's 10% what Harvard charges. Not so much. And the old child is begging, Daddy, play with me. Nothing, as if he doesn't exist. Not today, tomorrow, next week, and his whole child goes by, and you're absent. MIA, missing in action. And then Hashem's going to say, and you're going to say, sure, what do you mean? I treat everybody with so much respect. God, ask the rabbi in my synagogue. Every Shabbat morning I would come in, kiss his hand and everything, stand up for him when he got an aliyah. Yeah, I'm the number one. I said, the rabbi, yeah, that you were biased for. He respected you back because he needed your paycheck. Let's bring your sons. I said, how is daddy with you? Did he have patience? Uh, when you wanted to watch football on Sunday, did he tell you it's a waste of time or did he sit with you? So I said this recently somewhere and somebody got angry at me. I said, watch football, what type of values are these? I said, I said, sit with him. You learn that for me and he'll watch football, but you sit with him. That's his need, that's what he needs. So he tells me he doesn't believe, my, believe in my philosophies. So I tell him, the good thing with me is, I don't say anything for myself. I got a source for everything. So if you want to take it up with the Gemara, with the rabbis that said it, take it up with them. It's not a personal issue. This is what he mean. So I said, let me tell you an interesting thing. I have a very close friend. He's 25 years older than me, approximately. I'm trying to give him a long life. Who told me a mind-boggling story. When he was 16, 17 years old, he was going through a rough time. And you know what boys do when they go through rough times? They take it out either on their parents or on God or on both. But one of them is for sure happening. So he took it out on God. His parents he was cool with. He took it out on God. He's upset. He's not learning anymore. He skips yeshiva. He doesn't learn. doesn't put on tefillin. doesn't keep. doesn't this. doesn't that. <coughs> He's going to war with God. As if that's going to get him somewhere. And at one point, his father was desperate. He didn't know what to do anymore. So he went to Rav Shneir Kotler, the previous Lake with Rosh Shiva, Zechat Tzadik V'Kadosh Levacha. And he asked Rosh Shiva, Rav Shneir, Rebbe, what do I do? My kid, it's out of control. 
And Avshleya asked his father, what does he like doing? Now this is before modern day Chinuch classes. We're talking about Lakewood of 60 years ago. 50 years ago, whatever, you know. Bimloh Adara, Lakewood Ira Kodesh, in an authentic way. Rabbi Aaron's Lakewood. So he said, what does he like to do? He likes going to the movie theater. Back then, going to a movie theater was to, like today, saying that a kid goes to get high in a club, if not worse. It was unheard of in the film community that a kid would go to a movie. It was the biggest no that you could get. As the years went by, and there was Yudata Dorot, so many things became normal by us already, because we also had to adapt, as they say, unfortunately. But years ago, it was crazy. It was unheard of. So I said, perfect. Take him. Take him. The Rosh Shiva is telling me, take my son to the theater. He, he thought he was hearing wrong. So he said, Rebbe, maybe you didn't understand. Not the Bet Midrash. He wants to go to the movie theater. <laughs> so Rabshneya told him, I heard. And Rabshneya wanted to show him he understood. He said, I know there's a movie theater in Bricktown. That was the closest one to Lakewood back then. It's only 20 minutes away. Take him. So he tells Rabbi Shneir, but what do you mean? Marot asurot, I can't see it. Rabbi Shneir said, did I tell you to watch? I told you to take him. Sit with him. Close your eyes. You're the adult here. Yeah? Have self-control. Listen to this. He says, Rosh Shiva says we do. We don't. That's it. Case closed. He went to his son. He said, tonight we're having a date night. You and I. His son said, Dad, I'm not interested in learning. Leave me alone. What are we going to do together? He said, we're going to the movies. He said, Dad, everything okay with you? You're also going off the derech. <laughs> then it wasn't so fashionable to be OTD. He said, we're going. He said, why? He said, because if that's what's important to you, it's important to me. The kid didn't believe it, so he said, okay, let's go. He later on said, if he would have realized his father was serious, he would have said no, because he had no interest in going with his father. But he thought his father was messing around, so he messed around back. And he said, okay, what time are we going? Seven o'clock, seven o'clock it is. And the father went with the kid to the movies. Then the kid realized, wait a second, this is worth it. I don't got to take a bus. I don't got to figure out how I'm going to have money to pay for the ticket. Dad drives me, pays for the popcorn, pays for my ticket, sits with me and drives me home. Free limo service. And he don't, he's not interested, so he don't talk to me in the middle. He don't bug me. It's as perfect as could be. He started telling him every, other few, every few days. This movie came out. That movie wants to go. And here, this Talmud Chacham finds himself driving his son to the movies twice a week. Listen to what the boy said. The boy today is one of the big poskim. Mishum Kvodo, I don't say his name, even though I think he, want, he would want his name to be said, but I still believe we have to respect beyond that because of what a Torah genius he is. He said it was like the seventh or eighth time they went. And the father, you know, he can't open his eyes, right? He said, don't look. So he kept his eyes closed the entire time he was in the building. Now you can keep your eyes closed for two hours at a time and you're a Kolel student who learns hours and hours, you're tired, what are you going to do? Fall asleep. So he said, what well, used to happen every time we'd come to the theater, the, my father would pay for whatever, popcorn, this, that. We'd go into the theater, he'd close his eyes and fall asleep, and I'd watch a movie, and when we're done, he was normally wake up by then, because it would get quiet, and we'd leave. So it was, I think it was the eighth time he told me that they went to a movie. My father closed his eyes, fell asleep, he watched his movie, everybody was happy. And uh, he said, but this time, the movie's over. Everybody left the theater already, my father's still sleeping. I'm torn. I don't want to wake up my father, but at the same time, we got to get out of here, it is crazy. So I said, I'll wait five minutes. So that much self-control I had. He waited five more minutes, and then he tapped his father lightly, like, Dad, it's over, let's go, we've got to go home. And you know, sometimes when you're in a sleep and somebody wakes you up, or something wakes you up, you're a little flustered for the first few seconds. My father woke up and naturally said, Oh, the shear was over, I missed Kaddish. And he got up to say Kaddish. He, this, his father used to say Kaddish on his father. The guy, his whole life was Torah. That's what he knew. The Shia is over. Sometimes he fell asleep in the Shia. That's what he knew. This t- rabbi today, who then was the rebellious teenager, told me he got home that night. He couldn't stop crying the whole night. He said, my father, that his whole life is the Shia and Kaddish. Stop going to the Shia at night to spend time with me because it's important for me to go to the movies. And I'm going to slap him in the face like that? No way in the world. He went back to yeshiva. Today he's one of the Dolea Poskim. Many things we all do in our homes are based on his piskei halacha and his truot. That's when you make your son a melech. 
תמלכת את חברך. המלך means give him what he wants, not what you want. This comes up in so many different contexts in life. I gave, of course, the, the daily example. But here's the weekly example. Some of us are health nuts. Since COVID, it became trendy. Got to eat organic and no sugar and brown rice and this and that. Sorry, my friends. I'm going to tell you what I feel about it. Whole wheat is disgusting. Brown rice is disgusting. It has no taste. It's not meant for human consumption. That's what I feel about it. I'm entitled to my opinion. In America, if a man could say he's a woman, and well, I could say I don't like white rice. I don't like brown rice. Everybody could say everything today. So now you go and invite me for dinner, and you serve me all your health nut foods. You put me in the most uncomfortable situation. To eat that animal food I'm not eating, and not to eat, you're going to get insulted. And now what do I do? So I don't go anywhere. But if you would have cared about him, you would have said, let's find out what he likes to eat, and let's make something that he likes. Yeah, it's serious. Years ago, I once had this out with a doctor in Toronto. I used to go speak there sometimes. And they were also these health nuts of so soda, God forbid, they didn't have in the house. Like, right, Coca-Cola is the head of all evils in the world. So one Shabbat I was there, and there ain't no Coke. And me without Coke, there's no Shabbat. It's a problem. They took away all my own Shabbat instantly. Kids, so we figured it out through a goy, whatever, we got it at the end. But then Shabbat morning, I gave a speech. It was Parashat Chai I spoke about Chassat Tochim a little bit, a week late. And uh, I said, Chassat Tochim is to give you a guess what they want, not what you want. A week and a half later, I was back in Toronto, but this time for a weekday, not on a Shabbat. I spoke there in the same synagogue. And I was flying back the next morning to New York, but there was no flight late enough to get back. So I stayed in the airport hotel, attached inside the airport, there's a hotel. I stayed there, the first flight out at 5 in the morning to leave back. Before I leave the synagogue to go back to the hotel, I was going to take a taxi to the hotel back. This doctor comes over to me and hands me a bag, says, this is for you. I didn't ask any questions for me. Thank you very much. I wanted to get out of there. I want to go to sleep. I had to be up early in the morning. I come to the hotel room. I open it up. It's heavy. I was hoping it was cash, honestly. Uh, I said, that's so heavy inside a bag. There was a six-pack of Coke with a letter. We wanted to make sure you have what you like. I see that as an Adam Gadol. Here's a medical professional, right? She could say, my credentials. Uh, I studied. I could show you on an x-ray, on a this, on a that, what it does to you. You're killing yourself. Don't be my babysitter. Respect me. I actually had good babysitters when I was younger, but uh, I, I grew out of that age already. I can make my own choices. That's the idea of imlacht et chavecha. Why is it important to say, and why did I go to such an extreme and use words that maybe aren't so synagogue friendly? Because I have a, a very clear agenda here. A lot of times the reason why we don't respect people is because we don't like what they do. It bothers us the way they behave, the way they are, and most of the time we're actually right. And really, they shouldn't be doing what they're doing, and they shouldn't be behaving the way they're behaving. And they're 100% in the wrong. But in this week's parasha, we learn that doesn't make a difference. <coughs> Paro, a Nazi, a murderer. A Kadosh Baruch Hu comes to the Tugdole Olam, Moshe and Aaron, and tells him, make sure you have respect, he's a king. It makes no difference what you like about the other person's actions or not. It makes no difference if he's right or wrong. If he's a Jew, he's a Ben Shalmelech, he's a son of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And if he's a human, he was Nivra B'Tselem Elohim. And at that point, Imlachta et Chavelcha. You've got to turn him into a king. It's more than that. With the theme of what I just said, if you had a king coming to your house and he told you he wants to drink Coke, would you tell him it's not healthy? even if you were 100% sure it would be unreasonable doubt after working 50 years on your doctorate on it? No, why? Because he's a king. He could cut your head off if you, if you tell him something he doesn't want to hear. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells you, treat every Jew as a melech. Don't voice your opinions. Nobody's interested. This is what he wants. Treat him with respect. I, you think otherwise? You think. You're entitled to yours. He's entitled to his. And let's respect each other. Let's respect each other's differences. And then we'll be very much the same. And benachat ruach. That little means patience. I will be fair and say openly. Some people make it very hard to respect them. They want to make, they want to make sure you do the mitzvah behidur. That it comes with a lot of mesirut nefesh. They're being mezakeh you. They have good intentions. They want you to get more olam abaf for it. So they go out of their way to make you not want to respect them. But if you want to get into Gan Eden. So recently an acquaintance of mine tells me, uh, Be practical. 
uh, how do you do it in reality? This is very simple. Whenever you see the guy is annoying you and you, you want to do anything but respect him, just see your Gan Eden instead of him. Picture your Gan Eden. Decide what you want to do. So you're not respecting him. You're respecting Hashem because he was created in God's image. Disrespecting him is disrespecting Hashem. You're not going to make it. That's all you got to do. It works, by the way. It makes it a lot easier. Pchatzko Levenstein, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Levachar. Pchatzko, right? He was like the previous generation's father of Emunah, the one who grandfathered into the yeshiva system teaching Emunah and teaching Musar. His standard of ethics was very few people were able to live up to such standards. Who were Pchatzko students? So for example, Abdon Segel. I'm taking a long life in a flash lima. So people on that caliber, they were able to be a Pchatzko students. But regular people, it was a, a different world. So you would think that when Abchatzka wrote, or they wrote from him in the Sfarim, what the legacy that he wanted to leave over was to teach his children, or his students, were things that are on very high spiritual levels that we don't even understand what these things are. But I want to surprise you. I'm going to read you what his main message was to his students before Rosh Hashanah in one of the last years of his life. I'm reading it word for word literally. Oilayem lo'tam anashim. Woe to them to those people. Shemid yachasim lazulat. That treat others as if they were a piece of wood and, or an object with no value. Listen to these words. Because in the same measurement, meaning on the same scale of treatment, that a person is obligated to respect God as a king, and to accept upon him the yoke of serving Hashem, the same exact standard that you have to have respecting God, you have to have respecting your friend. Not only, are you, God forbid, not a lot of say things that can insult or hurt. He's obligated to glorify him like a king. And to feel yourself humble near him like a slave in front of his master. Every single person you interact with. I should, I'm not less than him. I'm more educated. I make a bigger salary. I have better character traits. I'm more famous. Why should I? I'm not, he should be an evid to me. He's the uneducated one. He's the one that got the issues. Ke'eved lifnei rabo. And who is this? The gdol hamashgichim of the previous generation who was the Baal Musar. He didn't come to his students in Ponovich Yeshiva and tell them, make sure you learn 18 hours a day. Because he knew that's not getting them into Gan Eden. He said, you know what my legacy is? You know what I want you to take away from me later on in life? <coughs> That you have to respect every single Jew the same way you respect Borei Olam. But what do you mean? He doesn't respect me. Why should I respect him back? So let's say something that's not so politically correct because I like getting myself into trouble. Many times we feel that God doesn't do what's fair to us also. Right? Why is God doing this to me? Make me sick. Make me this. Make me that. It's so unfair. But would you go spit in God's face even when you feel that way? No. After World War II, though, I know it was a small period of time that some people we can never understand or judge did that. But it was a very limited amount and it's beyond our perception. We have no way to even grasp what they went through. But besides for that, even the people with the biggest problems in the world, tzara, chay tzara, never, never. Maybe they were pain, they were angry at God, maybe they thought God should treat them differently, whatever they thought in their stupid way of thinking. But uh, nobody ever spat in God's face. So Abchatzko teaches you, just like you understand. Why not? You're angry at God. He didn't give you what you want. Because it makes no difference. Because he's God, and I'm not. And therefore, I respect him. Abchatzko says, you know what? When your wife didn't give you what you want, she's God, and I'm not. And I'm going to respect her, because I have to treat everybody. It makes no difference what she did or didn't do. Simply not interested. Sometimes you waste hundreds of thousands of dollars in marriage counseling over the years. It's like almost a marriage counselor is married to the spouse instead of the... That's really what it becomes at a certain point. It's sickening. 
He said, she said. He did, he did. Life's tit for tat. You gotta reciprocate. You gotta do all the fancy terminology. Torah doesn't talk about that. For years, I wasted time on people going down that road. Today, I'm not willing to do it anymore. My wife doesn't treat me. I said, who cares? Not interested. So if in Shulchan Aruch there's a reason you have to get divorced, which is a very limited reason that we're not going to talk Mishum Kvod HaTzibur, then get divorced. And if that reason doesn't exist, then Imlachta Et Chavelcha, who cares? I said, by the way, if you want encouragement, or you treat somebody like a Melech, they end up treating you like a Melech too. That's just the way the world runs. But if not, therefore what? I think Amara says about one of the rabbis that his wife was a real... Dot, 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 whatever you want to call it. She was a the devil. She gave him all the problems in the world. And he had great respect for her. And his students asked him, what is this? And he says, Lord, it's not enough that she saves me from sinning. That alone is a reason to have such great respect for her. Meaning he didn't tell him, no, she's not as bad as it seems. Or hopefully she'll change one day. He said, she won't change. And this is her. And she's a bad person. And she's going to mistreat me. But it makes no difference. She's my wife. And I owe her a karata tov as a person and as a wife. And I'm going to treat her with the utmost respect anyway. These are what says, it's unbelievable. So how many times do we see situations of people that fight and call each other names? Sometimes God forbid, even in a synagogue. Shekhinah disappears from the synagogue when people fight. Runs away. Hashem says, I can't see this. I'm out. Kabor Kosov, that was the previous Kosov Rebbe. Tzadik Levachah. Says he doesn't understand. He sees people so careful with not eating bugs. All right, it's very trendy today about the bug subject. Do you eat bodek? Do you not eat bodek? I am not here to promote anybody or downplay anybody. It's not my business. Do you check it this way with a light box, without a light box? Was there a bug? Was there not? Ayin shulchan aruch says davai no ni ala ayin is not a thing. I'm not saying halacha. Don't but just be aware that there might be more to the story than people are telling you. Um, but. I, Nobody wants to do love him of eating bugs, God forbid. Every Jewish home you go into, this one doesn't eat broccoli, the next one doesn't eat figs. This week I was eating a fig in my house, somebody looked at me as if I'm a goy. <laughs> he didn't know what, how to deal with it. I said, what's the problem? I opened it, I checked it, there was none, I ate it. I said, and guess what? You know where the first time I even learned what a fig tastes like was? Chamovad Yosef. I was buying for lunch one day and he gave me figs. That's how I even know what figs are. So, if it was good for him, good for me. And guess what? My vision is better than his. He was blind in one eye. I'm not. But, it says, what the You stick to the halacha and the rest makes no difference. So, the Kosovo says on this, so every house, this one doesn't eat that one, this one doesn't eat strawberries, and the other one, Hashem Yisrael, do whatever you want, I don't care, don't eat, starve all I care, <laughs> this is my business. As long as you have the ability to eat, if you're lacking food, let me know, we'll take care of it. But if, as long as you have the ability to eat, you pick your own path in life but he says they're scared to eat a tolat, a bug but they're not scared to swallow alive their friend that they're in a fight with <coughs> he says let them start we're not eating people alive and then we'll think about bugs later on and he says this is a very sharp line right in Tehilim Chavbet in the synagogue you know everybody's going to know all the psukim from Tehilim Kasfaradim right they, we read Tehilim out loud singing we memorize it at a young age David HaMelech says, V'anochi tolat velo ish. He says, you know what, what David HaMelech said? He said he realized he's dealing with people that want to kill him, that hate him. So he said, don't consider me a person, because people you'll eat alive. V'anochi tolat, I'm a bug, and therefore you can't touch me. I'm a bug from the heksha that you don't trust. Stay away. Leave me alone. Chaim Tzanzer says on that, a similar idea. And sons was previous sons of ever. So he says, very, very similar words, but just, he didn't use the example of a bug, he used the example of dam. Right? We can't eat meat or whatever with blood, so we have to salt. So he says, dam chaya in an off. We all understand zasu, of course, God forbid, nobody's going to. He said, if that's the case, his words are, asu lechol dam adam. You can't suck the blood, the blood out of somebody. Or now it's slang, suck the life out of somebody. Some people make their surroundings so miserable, they take the whole life out of them. It's a form of murder, that's what it is. Leave them alone, let people live. 
Just let people breathe, let people live. And not just live, and then have respect. Himlachta et chavelcha. Hi, and now listen a little bit to what I have to say on the subject. I was supposed to start at 9, I started at 9.20. So I don't know if that gives me an extension on the back end of 20 minutes, so that's my fault. How does it work over here? Because I'm a guest, you got to cut the rules. Whatever you want, you show me, I, I get the hint. Go like this, and we're good to go. No, I don't want anybody leaving and saying, oh my God, this guy came after three years and decided to keep us up all night. Now, Alta from Slabotka says that at one point, the mere yeshiva, he felt, needed some chizuk, some fresh blood. And he wanted to influence it. So he sent a young messenger of his, a kolel student that he trusted as a big tamit chacham, you know, to go there and to stick some young energy in, some new blood. Sometimes young energy is good for yeshiva. It brings life into the place. So he took the best of his young students, the number one guy, the biggest ilui, and sent him and said, go there, you're my messenger. Make the appropriate changes, do what you got to do, that place to continue growing. And this one, this guy went, he was a young guy, big time chacham, hot-blooded, but, you know, young people now don't think so much before they do. I'm not that old, Baruch Hashem, but I see from when I was in my 20s and 30s and now mid-40s, when I was in my 20s, I would make life and death decisions in 10 seconds. My 30s was about 30 seconds. By now, already, it takes a whole minute. As, as you get older, and it's not because I became slower or dumb. On the contrary, it's because I realized what's, why it's important to actually think it through properly, and not just spit advice. But young blood, we do things quickly. Da, da, da. A lot of hot air. He came there to the Shiva, and everything was Shem Shemayim, 100%, I'm sure. And he realized that one of the older mashgichim is a little old school and too tough. So he got rid of him gently, and he put in a different person instead. And he realized the different Magid Shiur wasn't speaking so clearly because he was older. They got rid of him too, and he stuck a younger guy in to give a better Shiur. You know, he took the appropriate measures, we'll say. And L'Shem Shemaim, to give a boost to the Yeshiva that the boys should want to learn. And it worked. The place was, went from its lesser good days to the best of the best. Fire! Ball of Torah, the whole place. Unbelievable. One year after this guy went to the Me Yeshiva, out of nowhere, got sick. In today's language, we would call it pancreas cancer. Should only be on Sunay Israel. A few weeks, dead. Gone. When the Alta from Slabodka heard that his student died, the one that he sent there, and he heard what he did and how much he helped the Yeshiva, and he said, It's true that he helped the Yeshiva. But when you take a person who's an older person who was a Mashgiach of Yeshiva and you put him aside, <coughs> you hurt his feelings. And that's why he died. He should have done it without moving anybody aside. Just add more staff, but don't eliminate the other ones. They shouldn't feel, oh, because I'm old, I'm not worth anything anymore. When I was younger and I was at my height of my career, so then I was worth something. But now that I'm older, I don't have the energy that I used to have, so now I'm not worth anything anymore. That's the reason why he died. He did it 100% Lashem Shemayim. He wasn't getting money out of it. He wasn't taking a job for himself. He had no kavod, no nothing out of this. And it worked. It proved to be right. All his choices were right. But it cost him his life. In English, that's called dead right. You could be right, but you're going to be dead too. That's literally what it's called. It's like the guy is walking on Fifth Avenue. Well, now you can't walk on Fifth Avenue because you have all the homeless there. But when New York still had a mayor, um, now we have a Evid, Bnei Cham. And there was still a mayor, Giuliani, I think was the last mayor in New York, if I remember correctly. Um, so he was still able to walk on Fifth Avenue. He was nice. He used to love go shopping in New York City. And the rest of it was a good day out. So imagine you're walking on Fifth Avenue. Some yellow cab, but a guy with a turban on. He's going 70 miles an hour. Now you have the right of way because you're, the walk sign is on. But he ain't looking because he don't care. So you could walk. You have the right of way. You're 100% in the right. He's going to be crossing a red and everything. But you're going to be dead. Because you're going to send you 30 feet up and from there to the funeral home. So don't be right. Be smart. Wait. Let him go by and then go. That's called dead right. Every time we argue with another person, we're probably right every time. I don't think we're stupid people. I think our judgments are great. But we're dead right. Just killed your Lama on the way. You're right. But you lost it all at the same time. So what's the practical implications of the criteria 
So Beleza Gadol in his will wrote to his students and his children. He wrote to his son, really, but also to his students. He wrote them, Bni, my son, if you want to succeed in life, how do you succeed in life? Al tihi kizvuv lechavelcha. Don't be like a fly to your friend. What does it mean to be like a fly to your friend? You're a fly? I'm not a fly. What does it mean to be like a fly? So he explains it. He writes, his words are, Shemaniach makom bari. A fly always leaves a healthy place. And where does he go? El hanagua. He goes to the unhealthy place. All right, you don't see flies when fruit are fresh. When the food is three days old and molding, then the flies all come. What did Rabbi Lezer Gadol say? Don't be like a fly to your friend. What does that mean? You know what he said? So when you look at your friend, don't see his weak spots. That flies do. They see what's sick. A healthy person only sees what's healthy. The rest doesn't exist. Who cares? Don't see it. Make sure you see the positive thing. And it fits very well because Rabbi Lezer Gadol himself writes an interesting thing. Why does Hashem make a person with two eyes? One eye is enough. You could see just well. You're not even legally blind. Even if you don't have one eye that works. And he writes, because Hashem gave you one eye to look at your own problems, but you have to fix yourself, and your other eye to see the good of your friend. I want to add on that unfortunately today we use one eye to see our friend's problems and one eye to see our good. It was meant to be the other way around. You have one eye to see the good of your friend and one eye to see your problems. Instead we turned it into one eye to see my good and his, and the other eye to see his problems. The Torah goes as far as protecting the evil, right? The Torah didn't write the names of the 250 people that were with Korach, even though they were Shaim, the Fort Moshe Rabbeinu. And the Torah, another mind-boggling thing, right? What's the most important thing in the world? We want Mashiach, why? The Kavot Shemaim in the world should be glorified. That's the goal, the rest is not interesting. All the rest of Yimata Mashiach is technical. The goal is one thing, the Kavot Shemaim in the world should be glorified. One of the ways Kvot Shemayim is glorified very easily is when there's a nis. It's a dangerous way because when people don't see miracles, they start their munah starts getting frazzled. But you see, anybody who saw a big nisim in their life, it had some sort of impact on them. I remember one of my acquaintances, I was very young then, it wasn't, we weren't so from back then. And he was by the Kotel on Sukkot one year when the Arabs, Yimach Shemam, stood on the top of Arabayt and threw down tens of thousands of rocks. There were 30,000 people standing in a small place. It wasn't built out nicely like it is today. They all had to go running for their lives because it was raining rocks on the, from the top of the Kotel. Now one person got injured. Everybody left harmless. From that day on, he never missed a day that he put on filin and Shabbat and everything. Over, in one second. He said, if God could do such a thing to protect his people... The Arabs, Yimach Shemam, they planned it out purposely, because when's the time that there's the most Jews by the Kotel? By Bekat Kohanim. And Lavdil Chabahav also. But they picked Bekat Kohanim, because there's also Americans there, so it'll make a bigger stink in the world. But they forgot that what is Bekat Kohanim? 20 seconds earlier, a few thousand Kohanim turned around and told Am Yisrael, God is going to bless you and protect you. So they could throw all the rocks they want. Tashem made a nest, nothing hurt. Forget about the rocks not hitting the people, which makes no sense, because I don't know if any of you were there, Bikat Kohanim. If not, it's worth spending a holiday in Israel just to experience it. But you're there physically attached to the person near you. There's not a square centimeter to move. So there's, there's no way that it fell between. There is no between. You can't see the floor. The biggerness is, when they started running for the exit, they should have trampled each other to death. Look what happened to Miron two years ago. Shalom Edan, that's a fraction of the people. It's a nes bitoch nes. As soon as he saw that, Hashem Elohim, his whole life changed. He became a bento. So he seemed to glorify God's name. One of the greater Nisim that historically is written in the Torah is when Bil'am wanted to go curse the Jews and God stopped him with an interesting messenger. He used a donkey to talk to him. That was the first time they invented Alexa. The original Alexa was a donkey. Gave him advice. You would think that that donkey should have been preserved forever. You're going to say it can't be preserved forever. There's no such thing. It could, because you see that the Gemara says clearly that one of the things that was created, Bein HaShemashot, Erev Shabbat, and Briyat HaOlam, was Piyat on the mouth of the donkey. That means it was already living a couple of thousand years. 
So if Hashem made it live a couple of thousand years, he could have left it to live a few more thousand years. Why is this donkey so important? Because forever and ever, every kid in Cheda, his Rebbe wouldn't have to tell him to learn. He would just take him to the zoo and show him the donkey that talks. And your Rebbe, you don't always listen to, but if the donkey tells you to learn, you're going to learn already. That's, uh, this is God. This ain't normal. What's going on here? I remember a bunch of years ago, I don't think it was true, but somebody at least had an imagination in New Square that some fish spoke to. You know, like Frank Sinatra was saying, I want to wake up in a city that never spe- sleeps. So later on, a, a Jewish comedian put out a song, he wants to wake up in a city that fish speak. So I, I don't believe the story was actually true, but it makes no difference. But why the story goes so viral? Because if a fish could speak, that, your wife speaks, you don't listen to her. But if the fish speaks, suddenly oh, the whole world stops. The whole world stops. What the fish spoke? So we should have kept that tone. The donkey speaks. Everybody would hear the donkey's wusad and we would all behave like donkeys. So why did the donkey die right away? Because I'll say right after he spoke, that was it. The donkey died. So as if it did its job in the world, gave Bilal Musad. You did your job, that's it. So Chazal say that Akadosh Baruch Hu took the donkey away right away that Bil'am shouldn't have shame from it. What type of shame? Chazal say very specifically, that people shouldn't walk and say, that's the donkey that gave Musa to Bil'am. But who is Bil'am? It's a shul, it's young people, but he was one of those that in New York is legal, and they have to pay for them and everything. It says clearly in Chazal. And by him, not only did he have a gender issue, he took it a step further. His soulmate was a donkey. Kipshuto with everything that has to do with that. So he was the lowest of the low. It don't get lower than that. Right? If that's what you're holding in life, it's not far that New York's going to do that law too. It's just a matter of time. If a man is not a woman, a woman, a man, everybody's confused. So why not a donkey? Because people love their dogs a lot more than they love their kids today. So why not? There's no end. Once sickness goes in, then there's no end to it. It's not far. The day is not far. Bilam was a low life. Just his simple behavior was a low life. And on top of that, he was a very gifted man and used his powers that God gave him against the Jews. He was going to go use his skill of prophecy that God gave him to curse the Jews. That was his plan. His plan was not to be a goody-goody and bail out of it. The donkey had to stop him. And on this degenerate that took God's gift to use against his own children, who's the lowest of the low in his personal behavior, Hashem says, we're going to kill a donkey right away. At the expense of 3,000 years of Kvot Shamayim that could have been added in the world, because it's not worth all the Kvot Shamayim in the world, if one kid's going to say, that's the donkey that gave Musad to Bilam. Not worth it anymore. You hear what's going on here? When you're in shul and somebody's talking, you go to them and say, Shah, it's not worth the whole shul if you insulted a person by saying Shah. It was better that there should have not been a shul. You're going to tell me that it says in Shachar Goarim Bos. Number one, it only says in Shachar Uch, everywhere else it's in Yisur Gamu. And number two, it says that you have to be a person that can testify about himself that is flawless in these halachot. Good luck. If there's anybody like that, let me know. I'd love to learn how you do it. Because it's not worth it. It ain't worth all the Kvod Shamayim if somebody got hurt on the way. Moshe argued with God for seven days not to go take the Jews out of Egypt because he was scared. Not that he's insulting his older brother. His older brother might feel a little bit disappointed. Now, Paro is killing tens of thousands a day. Seven days, 150,000 at least more people in a simple calculation from the numbers of the Midrash died. Moshe, people are dying. Who cares right now about Aaron's feelings? So let's break this down a little step further. Pialacha, a guy works in Atzala. He's sitting Friday night, he's in the middle of Kiddush, his radio goes off, lady just had a heart attack. They got to go save her. And his wife tells her, oh, it's going to disappoint me if you leave the table. Does he have to leave or not? He has to leave. Koch <coughs> nefesh. It's not even a question at all. Could be he should have not signed up in the first place if his wife's not capable of dealing with it. But once he signed up and he's the one that they're relying on, he has no choice. He has to go. So if that's the case, okay, so I don't will be disappointed. Who cares? You have to save life now. We'll deal with his insulting later. We'll go to him. We'll appease him later on. This is not my question. The Briskov asked this question. Listen to what the Briskov answers. The only way we can understand this is that it must be Muchach, that Aaron understood 
that there's no possible way that in the long run anybody's going to be saved if it's on the expense of his brother. So it wasn't Pikuach Nefesh anymore. Because today, on the short term, it might look like we're saving a few people, but on the long run, we're going to kill many more. You hear what it says? Kids dying, being slaughtered by Paro every day, dying, bloodbaths. But maybe my brother will feel a little disappointed on what? That I became the leader and not him. It's not like he earned it. It's not like he deserved it. But he's older. He happened to be born first. And definitely nothing good is going to come out of this anymore. Think about it. A shul has to be a place that people love coming to. People are excited to come to. Especially the younger generation today that they look forward to coming to. The whole week they think, what's the most fun place to be? Shul. Happiest place to be, sure. Then they come, and this one yells at him, and the other one says, shut up, and this one, eh, get out of here, why'd you come? Why do you open a shul for? Close it, you're better off. Where's Kvot Shemayim? There's no Kvot Shemayim coming out of this. When somebody comes to me in my shul and says, Rabbi, I don't know what to do, the guy near me talks, I can't. I said, I never heard him. I don't know why you heard him. If you were focusing on your doubting, you would have never heard him. So maybe we should learn how to focus on Davin. First, we eliminate that person from the conversation completely. He's out. Now, let's figure out what to do on a technical level. We take that approach as a matter of days that everybody is quiet and everything runs smoothly. Because there's no conflict anymore. There's no nothing. It becomes a cool thing to respect the shul at that point. Because the cool guys, they're the ones who do it. It's a much, better, much healthier approach to giving over a message that's important. But again, every time we're ready to rebuke somebody on something, let's remember that God gave up on 3,000 years of Kvod Shamayim from the Piaton that he created from Sheshiti Mei Breshit. So the lowest of the low degenerate shouldn't get embarrassed that somebody says, that's the donkey that spoke to him. Today. And this Gemara is Nifsak in Shulchan Aruch HaRachayim Chav Gimel Aleph. Siman Chav Gimel Sifa, right? Obviously. The Gemara says, when a person goes to visit a cemetery, time appropriate, somebody's yard site tonight, whatever, I guess we go before Chatzot tomorrow at the grave, so, a um, person has a yard site, they're going to his grave, and you go to a cemetery, it says, and the Gemara, and it's Nifsak in Shulchan Aruch HaRachayim, if, even if you're somebody who wears his tzitzit strings out, which we don't do, but Ashkenaz do, you have to put them in, you have to hide them. And if you can't hide them, you take them off, if there's a logic reason why you can't put them in. Why? So the Yemah says, because Imover, if he doesn't do it, and he walks to the cemetery with his tzitzit out, he does a sin, what's the sin? Lo eg larash cheref oseyu. Makes a mockery out of the poor. The guy's dead, there's nobody poor here, what's going on? So what does it say in the Gemara? That when a person's dead, he understands the value of mitzvot. And he's dying to put on more tzitzit. He realizes now what tzitzit is. What a schut every second you wear tzitzit is. And when you come into the cemetery wearing tzitzit, and he can't wear tzitzit because you're alive and he's dead, you're making a mockery out of his, his inability to do what you're able to do. And you're causing pain to another person even though he's dead already. And therefore, take your tzitzit, hide him, because he shouldn't feel pain from it. So if in Allah it says, that you have to hide a dvar mitzvah from somebody else who can't do the dvar mitzvah, yeah, you have to hide a dvar mitzvah from somebody else who can't do the dvar mitzvah, Salah kama v'kama, you have to hide your opinions on things, not to hurt somebody who's trying to do a mitzvah and still didn't learn how to do it the right way. Let's take a practical example. So, there was... A rabbi, his name was Rabbi Shalom Mordechai HaKohen Shvadron. But not Rabbi Shalom Shvadron, the Magi, that died less than 20 years ago. His grandfather. His grandfather was the Marshami Berzan. 
Sholem, the one that we knew, put out his grandfather's fari in the shed. All the truth of the Marsham that we have today is because his grandson put it out. It was Gaon Olam. He lived in the times, same times as the Nodab Yehuda, the great Nodab Yehuda. <coughs> so the Marsham writes an interesting thing about the Nodab Yehuda. He had a huge respect to Nodab Yehuda. The Nodab Yehuda in the latter part of his life was the chief rabbi of a city called Prague. Beautiful city. If you didn't visit, go. And there's a good kosher hotel there too. I give him a plug because they treated me well recently. Um, it's good to go to these places, by the way. It should connect our history a little bit. So when the Nodab Yudah got the job as the rabbi of Prague, he came to Shul Shabbat, the first Shabbat that he's the rabbi, and he sees an interesting thing going on. They had a bima, let's see, like this, and they start out Torah, they bring out the Sefer Torah, and the Gabai stands on the side of the bima, and by some people that get aliyahs, he holds out something, and by other people, he doesn't hold it out. And the Nodab Yudah, if he's the rabbi, he's responsible for everything that goes on in the Shul, so he wanted to know what's going on. So he walked over to see like, what, what the deal is. And then Odabi Yudha saw that they had a card, like the one over here, that said the brachot of the Torah, because of the Torah. So when the Gabai knew that the person getting the Aliyah is a learned man, so he didn't hold out the card, because the guy knows it by heart. When it was somebody that he thought maybe doesn't know the brachot, he didn't want him to be embarrassed to say the brachot the wrong way. So he was protecting him, so he held out a card, you know, quietly, you know, hidden way, so he should have a card to read it off of. Then Odabi Yudha saw this and got horrified. No, he wasn't horrified that people don't know how to say Bikot Torah. That's an easy thing to teach. That's not a problem. He was horrified because in al it says in many different contexts that if one knows how to do something and others don't know how to do it, then nobody does it. That we shouldn't make somebody who doesn't know how embarrassed. Today it's less applicable because everything's in print and everybody could read everything. So it's, the practical implications are less common. But for example, there is a minhag in many Jewish communities that chatanim or chatanei bar mitzvah don't speak. They get up, they say good evening, and they sing, Oy Shoma, and that's it, they go down. Why not? The mother's waiting 13 years to see her son speak. The photographer for sure is waiting, and the grandmother, alachat kama vakama. Why deprive them of this pleasure? Because there are kids that have stage fright, and it's not fair that one kid should have stage fright and be embarrassed to speak, and then be double embarrassed that his friend could speak and he can't. It's just not right. I hope this doesn't sound wrong, but I'm going to tell you, I got to a point in life after being not well for a while that I learned what's important and what's not. It was a very humbling experience. Today I'm willing to say a lot of things that five years ago you would have never heard me say. But when I look back on my speaking career, there were many years that I should have not spoken in many places I spoke. Because their rabbi doesn't know how to speak well. And then a guest speaker comes, puts up a good show, I don't have to deal with the garbage of the community all year, all year like he does, the poor Rabbi Hazit, all their problems, all their thing, they make him crazy. I come in, show business, landed on a plane, first class, with a limo waiting for me outside, brings me to the shul, looking spiffy, put up a show, rocked the house for two hours, and then the next board meeting, they say, we need a new rabbi, we want a guy like that. When I got sick, I went and went, all my records of everywhere I had that I spoke, and any rabbi that I thought is not a better speaker than me, I called individually to ask forgiveness from I should have known to say no and not agree to speak in his truth. And that minimized him in the eyes of his community. And you're going to say, what do you mean? Hashem gave you a gift. Hashem gave you a gift, not on the cheshbon of somebody else. The gift is worthless. Nothing good is going to come out of it. It's on the expense of somebody else. There are rabbis that are big. They come they call me and say openly, I know you're a better speaker than me. I don't care. I don't have self-confidence issues. I'm a Tamit Chacham, you're not. <laughs> you know, you go do your show business, make the community happy and get out of here. And then let me go deal with the real problems. But not everybody has that level of confidence. And it's not okay. Even if it means building a better community, and even if it means making, it's not okay. You can't put somebody else in a situation like that. No, Dabi Uda, the first week as a rabbi, sees this going on, says this can't happen. Why does the person who doesn't know have to be embarrassed that they're sticking out a card for him? So when the Nodab Yudah went up to get his aliyah, first week on the job, aliyah chishi, the rabbi gets, tells the gabai, where's the card? So what do you mean? He says, I don't know, I said, because of the Torah, where's the card? <laughs> he knew the whole Torah by heart. The Nodab Yudah testified on himself that from the time he walked from his seat over here to the bimat al aliyah, how long could it be already? Ten seconds? Let's exaggerate. A minute? He reviewed 
50% of Talmud Bavli by heart in his brain. And on the way back, he reviewed the other half. And between Amida and Chazarat Hashatzu Musaf, he reviewed the Yerushalmi. So every Shabbat when he made Kiddush, he made a Siyum on Bavli and Yerushalmi. So he was able to do that. But he didn't know because Torah by heart suddenly. Couldn't remember it. It was too hard for him. The Marsham says that he went to the Madab Yudah and said, what's this about? He said, like this, the guy left him, who really doesn't know how to do it, doesn't have to feel embarrassed anymore. Yeah, the rabbi doesn't know how to say Pahat. If the Nodab Yudah understood that on his first week of his job, and by the way, he paid a heavy price for it, because Nodab Yudah had many people that were against him because he was considered like fanatic and whatever, and they didn't <coughs> like the fact that he's so fanatic. And they used this as ammo against him. Hey, they say he's such a big Tamil Racham, he doesn't even know how to say Pahat. Pahat. And he never responded to it. He stayed quiet and took all the insults just to protect the dignity of the other people that don't know. Yeah, hey, what's going on? This is what the level of what Hashem expects from us. Hoy. You got more time or I'm done? I'm tired. I don't mind if you say I'm done, by the way. But if you don't say I'm done, then I, I have smart things to say, but I think this one. I'll give you one more story, and then I guess... Well, part happily, because I want to get home too at one point. It was a great rabbi, his name was Ramot Chabanet. Ramot Chabanet was one of the Dolei Aposkim. He lived in the city of Nikolsburg, in Tilkataf Kuf Peitet, I think, or something like that. Yeah, Tilkataf Kuf Peitet. In Tav Kuf Peitet, there was a town named Lichtenstein. And there was a big, then they used to have the gathering of the Dolei Israel. Every year they would gather together in a different town. A few years ago came out an enhanced video of what they think is the Chafetz Chaim going to the Krisiyah Gdola. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, I said, I don't know if they know for sure. They think it was the Chafetz Chaim. There's no factual evidence to say. Right? Um, probably it is. Hopefully it is. It's good to see such a thing. So like this they had every year in a different town. And the Gdolim would get together. So in the year Tafkuf Peitet, he went to the Knesiyah Gdola, the rabbis then, I don't know if it was called yet Knesiyah Gdola, it could be then it was called Asifat Al-Abanim still. Um, and he went to the city of Liechtenstein, that's what was taking place. In the middle of the weekend thing, whatever, the gathering, there was a few days during the week, and Shabbos, he got sick, so I lay in 24 hours, he died. He died there, and they weren't equipped for this, they, nobody expected the Gdola Do to die on them. They didn't know what to do. They decided that his body might be contaminated because of his illness and this and that for different reasons. They buried him over there in Liechtenstein. No big levayal, kaya elik dolado, no nothing. Quick burial, quick levayal, well, put him in to the local Jewish cemetery. Back then, it was very hard to transfer an iftar from one city to another. So even if they would have known otherwise, they probably would have not been able to just logistically move him to his city to make him a levayal there. It wasn't like today that we have ways to do everything quickly. And then came a big problem. He lived in Nikolsburg. That's where he was the rabbi of. His students heard he died and he's buried in Liechtenstein. They said, a chutzpah. Our rabbi is not going to be buried in our town. He was the rabbi of our town for so many years. They don't even know who he is. And they wanted to move the body to dig up the grave. Under certain circumstances, you're allowed to do it. Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, Zechat Tzadik Lerachah, was involved, for example, in bringing up the bones of the body of the Chida Kadosh. To Israel, he's buried in Aram Nechot now. Others claim that somebody else was involved in bringing the Ben Ishchai's body to Arazetim, or Sheken or Shiloh. But there is a tombstone there that says that it's the Ben Ishchai's grave. I'm saying somebody brought it, the question is if he got the right body or not. But uh, there's definitely, there was a body that was moved, that's for sure true. Like this we have in history, a lot of stories like that. So the people of Nicholsburg came and said, we want the body, we're digging up the body. And the people of uh, Lichtenstein said, no, he's a great rabbi, he was he died, he was died here, he was buried here, we wanted Tzaddik to be buried in our city, you're not taking him. Eight years ago there was a fight like that in Uman, some guys wanted to dig up Rav Nachman's grave and bring him to Israel. Police got involved, this stuff, pretty ugly what went on there. But look, they're fighting over a good thing, everybody wants the Tzaddik to be by them. So they decided that they're going to go to the Khatam Sofer, and the Khatam Sofer is going to be posek what to do. He's going to decide what to do. 
They went to Chatam Sofer and they told him, this one said his side, the other one said his side. And Chatam Sofer said he's going to write a letter with his decision. Why write a letter? Chatam Sofer did this many times on those controversial subjects and communities that he had to settle. He did it in writing so nobody could say he misunderstood, he didn't mean this. Here's the fact, this is what he wrote, this is what you have to do. So he wrote a long tshuva in Alacha to write the Peshat Tachak, which this is definitely a Peshat Tachak, that he got sick suddenly and died in 24 hours. You're allowed to take a body of an Adam Gadol out of a grave and bring him to his original town, and that's the res- proper respect for him to do that, because that's where he was the rabbi and whatever, and they should do it. Finished writing the letter, and he signed it. And back then there was no pens, right? They used a feather and ink, or a squill and ink. And he bumped by mistake into the ink, and the ink spilled over and blackened the whole letter he just wrote. And when that happened, he said, that must be a sign from Shammai, and they don't like what I wrote, and they're saving me from sending this. And he told him, for now the body stays. i got to rethink it. And he started rethinking it, but he didn't know what to think. <coughs> the right thing to do is to move him. But he didn't understand. Why did the ink spill? What's going on? And it took about three months later, he still didn't come up with a decision, and both sides are fighting and waiting for a decision. And one night, Ramot Chabanet comes to the Chatam Sofer in a dream. And he tells him, let me tell you what's going on. I'm going to help you make the decision. Ramot Chabanet was the one who died, right? The rabbi that they're fighting over his butt. He said, when I was younger, I was considered a top Talmud Chacham as a single boy. And I dated a girl for a couple of weeks, and I got engaged to her. And I was engaged for three months. After three months, I still wasn't my wedding date. It was a few months then. It took a long time until I got married because I had to earn money to have money to get married. It was a few months before I was going to get married. And I realized that it was a mekach ta'ut. There were things wrong with the kala. That I had to break the engagement. And I broke the engagement. And he said, I broke it with a psak alacha from my Rebbe. And you know, it was clear, it wasn't even a question that it had to be done. But the man said, a girl had a lot of suffering from it. She felt terrible. Yeah, she was supposed to get married to a guy who was considered the brand name future rabbi of Am Yisrael, which he ended up becoming. And she got dumped. Not a good feeling. Nobody should ever need to know such things. And he told them like this. So for three months, she was engaged to me. So she had an illusion for three months that she's going to marry me. And after three months, she got disappointed. He said, being that at the end of the day, she got hurt from it, even though halachically I was right, and that was the right thing for me to do, in Shamayim they decreed that I'm going to die young, and I'm going to be buried near her for three months, to make up for the three months in this world that I caused her to think that she's going to marry me. And he left. Khatam Sofer woke up, and he said, very simple now what to do. And they said, but really, after three months, I could be buried in Lichtenstein. He made a calculation how much time is he involved in this discussion. It was exactly three months. He went running to the cemetery to see who's buried near where they put in the ground on Mount Chabanet. Lo and behold, the grave on the right side of him is this girl that he dumped. So he knew the story was true, and then he wrote a new tshuva in Alacha, which you could find in Shailot Veshu al Khatam Sofer, which explains the whole thing and says that they should move the body. The Khatam Sofer is in Chelek Vav, Siman Lamedzain. Over there in Tshuvat Khatam Sofer, look, you can see it inside, it's very interesting. He writes part of the story. And he writes how he came to the conclusion with the dream and everything. You hear what's going on? Halachically, he was right. He found out that there was serious problems with the girl. And it was a mekach ta'ud. And he got a psak alacha from Adam Gadol that he has to break the engagement. He's not allowed to get married, even if he wants to. But af al came. The girl got tired from it. And Shamayim on the spot. They decided they're going to take his life at a young age. And he's going to be buried near her to make up for the three months that he gave her an illusion. Oh, when you hear something like that, what a wake-up call, how much you have to be careful with the respect and the honor of somebody else. Could be she died of heartache. You know? <laughs> she lost the Gdol Ado. He later on became the Gdol Ado. <laughs> so, no? And I end off with one more story. I have a lot more, but this is really, I just looked how much time I'm speaking. It's really exaggerated. Really. Okay. I'm getting tired. Um... It was a great rabbi in Israel that, I don't know, I don't know if there's anybody here old enough to have the schut and um, But uh, he used to say shir, not shir and gmar, shir and ashkafa, musa, and his son's yeshiva in, in Bnei Brak. His son had yeshiva in Bnei Brak. 
called Nachlat Yaakov. Nachlat Yaakov is run by the Barzil family. So the grandfather, his name was Ezra Barzil. His son opened the yeshiva Nachlat Yaakov. Ezra Barzil used to come to his son's yeshiva to give Sichot Musa during the week. So Gaon Olam and a big Baal Musa. Trump Shadron used to quote from him a lot. Ben Galinsky quoted from him a lot. He was, he had a different way of thinking about Jewish theology. So here's a story. One Purim, the boys were talking, you know, in the afternoon when they started drinking, where are they going to go to? The, which rabbi are they going to go to this Purim? Purim is a very holy day, special day. Maybe Hashem will give me the health and the strength. I'll come back before Purim to give you some chizuk for what Purim is all about. So they wanted to spend it in the best way. So every year they would go to a different one of the rabbis. So they were discussing between them which rabbi they're going to. So of course, the Rosh Hashivah's father's name came up as an option. He was the oldest rabbi. They said, maybe we should go to Rabezu this year. So the older boys wanted to go to him because they felt a connection to him. The younger boys said, no, we're not going to him. Why not? They said, he's an old man. He's not fun. It's Purim. We want to have fun. He's not going to let us have fun. He's always serious. Baal Musat. Purim is a day of fun. And they're right, by the way. So they got into an argument. At the end, the compromise was that all the boys presented a compromise. Said, we're going to go to him. If after five, ten minutes, we see that you're right, and he's keeping it, you know, depressing, so you leave. I'll go to the next rabbi. But uh, let's give it a shot, because if it does work out, to go to him, he's the oldest. That's the biggest rabbi that we got in the issue. So they went to his house, and when they walked in, he saw the students coming to him. He wasn't expecting it. He got all excited. He started dancing with them. Sason v'simcha. And the boys between themselves were shocked. Right? This is the serious rabbi. He was going all out. And they, and they calmed down like they were worried it wouldn't be fun. This is as great as could be. Suddenly, out of nowhere, three, four minutes into it, everybody quiet. Stops the whole party. And the boys start whispering with him, oh, this was just a joke for two minutes, but now the true colors are coming out. The old man can't have fun. Shem should forgive me for talking that way. So one of his children overheard the boys talking. So he went to him and said, what are you talking about? Who, what, what? He was embarrassed to tell the, the rabbi's son what they're talking. He put pressure. He said, I'll tell you the truth. We had a discussion before we came here to come or not to come. And uh, some of us didn't want to come because your father's older or whatever. We're young. We want to have a good time. And yeah, you see, after two, three minutes, he tells us we have to be quiet. It's poor and we're quiet. We want to have fun. The Gemara says if you did damage on Purim through the Simcha, you could be patur even then. So obviously there's a lot of leniency on Purim. So he said, so why whisper about it? Let's find out why he said it. I said, we're not asking. He said, I'm his son, I'll ask him. He went to his father and he said, the boys are right. They want to have a good time. Why are you telling them to be quiet? <laughs> oh, he said, Abed Zabazan gets up and tells the boys, boys, I want you to have fun. And you see, I danced to you when you came in because it's Purim and you should have fun. You know why I told you to be quiet? Because three minutes in, I realized, wait a second. Next door to me, and he points to the wall of his house, and the other side of this wall is a lady that her husband was. I've been seeing Bamberger. I've been seeing Bamberger was, was the Mashgiach and Ponovich Yeshiva, and he died later from a sickness. And his widow lives next door. Every year, Purim, until last year when he was still alive, the boys from Panovich used to come in the afternoon, like you came to me, to their house to sing and dance with the Mashgiach. But this year, they're not going to come to the widow. It's not appropriate to come to the widow alone. And now she's going to hear boys in my house singing and dancing. It's going to bring her out the pain that she lost her husband. Fun we could have, but the murder in Almona, that nobody has had. Now you understand why I told you to be quiet? How many times the people, sometimes you think, you mean well, that's what hurts, right? None of us are bad people. We don't deliberately go behave like idiots. It, most of it comes out of Hashem Shemaim, out of good intentions. You're making a simcha and you're so excited and you love people and everything. So you go all excited to your friend with some fancy invitation and telling them about all the plans for your son's bar mitzvah or your grandson's daughter's bar mitzvah or your daughter's wedding. Or the, and you forgot that your friend, Chazid, doesn't have children. You're a rotzeach. What are you doing? They never had a child to make a bar mitzvah for. Why are you shoving it in their face? Some people have kids that have problems, can't get married, don't get married. Who knows if they'll get married? Married to Goyim, even worse. What are you doing? Tone it down. Now, you don't mean bad. You mean good. 
My friend, what do you mean? I'm going to share with her. She's be, be sensitive to some. Think what they're feeling, not what you're feeling. Who cares about what you're feeling? That's not what's important. What's going through their mind? What's going on through their heart? Think about that. In my house, a lot of times we host people. Either that their marriage line didn't work out, or that a spouse died, or we make sure that any differences that exist in the house should come out when the other people are there. So they shouldn't feel like the other person's marriage is ay 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 and I don't have a spouse. Yeah, not so easy to be married after all. Okay, don't know what. I mean that literally. Guy tells his kid to say a dvar Torah by the Shabbos table. So he doesn't remember that his friend that's sitting by the same Shabbos table that he invited, the kid just dropped out of yeshiva. So what are you going to do? Spill salt on his womb that his son dropped out because he couldn't learn? And your son could say a whole speech when he's 10 years old by the table. What are you doing? You're killing him. Why is that okay? I, the kid, needs to express himself. Fine, so don't invite people like that then. But it's just not fair. There's nothing that gives a head to do that. And this is what I'm saying. It's not coming out of a bad place. Nobody means bad. We actually mean good. We think when we're going to invite somebody to something, we're doing the best deed in the world, right? I'm making him feel included. We don't take into expense all the emotions around. I remember when I made a wedding for my daughter. So it turned out I didn't make much of a wedding, but I thought I was making a wedding at least. You know, it was COVID. My daughter was the first COVID wedding that got shut down in New Jersey. Um, I had a friend who was very wealthy, close friend. Called me a few weeks before the wedding. He was also marrying off a daughter. His wedding was the last wedding that they let happen. He married off on Sunday night. I married off on Tuesday. He calls me like two weeks before the wedding. For us, it was exciting, the same age, making a wedding the same week. It was like a big deal. And he randomly talks to me like two weeks before the wedding, and I know he's extremely wealthy. I happen to be his guy by so I know how much money I give out from his checkbook. So just from that alone, I understand a little bit of his wealth. He starts telling me on the phone in a random conversation, which was a little bit out of character for me. Only later I put together what's going on. That it's so expensive to marry off a kid. It's out of control. You have to take a home equity loan for the wedding and for this, and... The kids want such crazy things, $200,000 wedding, and they complaining. I wrote countless $200,000 checks from his account to charity on random Mondays and Thursdays, you know, just out of nowhere. So, you know, I didn't think that that was the big deal over here. It was funny to me. To the point that I naively at the beginning suspected maybe he fell into hard times. You know, people are later, we should never know. They fall into hard times. A few weeks later, it dawned on me, you know, COVID hit and shut the world down. So it was time to think and analyze things that otherwise we wouldn't have time to do. It dawned on me that he's such a real friend that he knew I was also making a wedding and he knew that I'm not rich like him. And that for me, making a wedding is a big expense. And I probably did have to take a loan to make a wedding. So he didn't want me to feel that I'm less and he's more because he has all the money in the world. So first he sent me a huge gift without me even knowing behind my back. And then he also downplayed his thing that he has so much chavis and stress and this and that from his wedding. And about a year later, I met him somewhere. My daughter got married right before Purim. It was Purim a year later. So he came to my house to visit briefly on Purim, and I was a little tipsy. So I was more expressive than I normally would be. And I asked him openly. I said, that's why you did it? And he said, you're too smart. Even that, I can't get by you. Look how sensitive, what a real friend is. Now he could say to himself, what do you mean? I'm rich. He's not. You should learn to deal with it. Not everybody's wealthy in the world. Which is true, by the way. We should learn to deal with that. That that some schools have all these rules that you can't make a party and invite the friends because they might be jealous. They're not equipping the kids with basic skills for life. A kid has to know from when he's two years old, yeah, some people will have more than us and we're not jealous. We're happy for them. That's a very healthy thing to know. Not everybody has to be the same in the world because that's not the reality. But you see what a person who's imlach to chavel chai says, at the end of the day, I have more means than he does. Why should my friend feel, oh, how lucky my friend is. He doesn't have to go through the stress of paying these bills than I do. I don't think that I do also. Sensitivity of a person. No wonder why his kids, one by one, each one's better than the next. Shem sees a person that behaves like that, he says, okay, so his kids are going to come out. So, yeah, let's conclude that if a Kajboku said that Paro, the mass murderer, we have to respect, so him lachtait chavircha, we should really work on it to make sure that every single person can, Let's start with the Jews, and then we'll continue on. No, but really, the goal is every person. But let's start, we have to start somewhere. I say, you know what, let's start with our wife and our children, or our husband and our children. 
Then we'll go on to the community. Then we'll go on to the neighborhood. Let's take it step by step. But let's start somewhere. And a practical implication to make everybody feel wanted and desired and like a real melech and not let the Yitzhah fool us with all different Hashem Shamaim that's going to destroy what's really important in life. And in that schut, we'll see Mashiach Tzidkeinu, if you see what's going on in Israel in the past few days, I think you realize why we say in the tefillah three times a day, Ashiva Shofteinu Gevarishonav, Yuratzeinu Gevatchila, Vaser Mimenu Yagon Vanacha. I never understood what's Vaser Mimenu Yagon Vanacha. I never understood this. You want to hear what it came to me there one morning in Davening this week? Shiva Shofteinu Gevarishonav. Hashem should bring back. This is only going to be good for those who understand a little bit of Israeli politics. Um, for those who. Hashem should bring back our judges like they used to be. Yoatzeinu and our advisors, Kivat Chila. What's Yoatzeinu? Where do we see advisors? We see that Paro had an advisor, Achshverosh had an advisor, but other than that, where's their advisors in Torah? It's another question, by the way. Vaser mimenu yagon vanachan. Hashem should take away from us sorrow, cries of sorrow. What do the judges have to do with cries? Like, the whole thing made no sense. I, I never understood this Tfilah. Yeah, of course we want it. We should have Bedin again instead of all this garbage. But then I saw an amazing thing. After five Purim spiels of elections in Israel, finally even the Arabs couldn't produce enough fake votes. And the right wing came back into power and Netanyahu got power again. And they went, ran on a ticket of an agenda that they're going to stop the corrupt judges from appointing each other. And there's actually going to have to be somewhat of a reasonable law and order in Israel from now on. We can't just go frame people because we're in the mood of getting them out of politics. And... Uh, the Siat Beishbat Elyon, which she doesn't deserve her name being said in a synagogue, send her a flash name out, we should pray for her, she's sick mentally, um, decided to give some rambling political speech and went on a whole campaign. And then the politicians also that were against Netanyahu wanted to instigate. So now they have a new minog, Baruch Hashem, they have what to do. There used to be a problem, that there was nothing to do in Israel. It was a boring country. So they would bring celebrities, right? They brought Maroon 5 and this. So every Tzaru and every Zav they brought there. Uh, but now they don't need it anymore. They have a new entertainment. They go to Havganot on Saturday night. They have purpose in life. They have what to protest for. So I said, Shiva Now we dive into Hashem. We should get back normal judges. But then we say, Vaselvi menu yagon manachai, and stop those idiots from crying and screaming on the streets. We want normal judges with quiet on the streets, without Afghanot, without this, with the roads closed. It should be peaceful. It should happen peacefully. And in case we weren't one hundred percent sure, we saw an interesting thing this week with the Supreme Court's ruling about Derry operating as a minister, the ten Ashkenaz people that were the left-wing originals, they voted against the one Sephardic guy. You know, he was the one who had the heart to say, what are you talking about? This guy does so much good, let's help him. But only good comes out of these things, by the way. I don't know how much you know the dynamic of the politics and Orthodox community in Israel, but it wasn't, it never happened before that the big Ashkenaz went to a Sephardic politician to show support. Unfortunately, there's a big division, and these things don't happen. And today, Abu Chmot Chezrachi and Rashi Vaponu Nishav Pavalski, all the Ziknei Ador of the Ashkenazim, went to Ayyadari's house today to show him Chizuk and pose for pictures with him and everything. But that alone, this whole story was worth it. It's bring a whole new unity. Now people are sticking up for each other in the film community. They realize we can't fight. We need each other. Everybody's against us. It's a whole new level of unity going on. This could bring Moshiach. Hashem loves unity. So they thought they're causing us a problem. In reality, they're doing us the biggest favor. They're bringing us together, united. We should go over here. We should live in a derech of malchut. And with that, we'll have a lot of good things in our whole life. Amen, amen. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun.